a video. This is a scrambled egg going back into its shell. It's an illustration as to how the universe works. No egg ever goes back to being scrambled back into its shell, and so it is with the entire universe. It is slowly degenerating. It's going from order to chaos. We can see that everywhere. But listen closely as this speaker slips in the words, general tendency. And the wife are separated, and now they're going to be poured back into the egg. And we all know in our heart of hearts that this is not the way the universe works. And we know in our heart of hearts that the universe does not travel from mush to complexity. In, in fact, this gut instinct is reflected in one of the most fundamental laws of physics, the second law of thermodynamics, or the law of entropy. What that says basically is that the general tendency of the universe is that the general tendency of the universe is to move from order and structure to lack of order, lack of structure, in fact, to mush. It's not a general tendency, it's an unbending law. Everything is turning to disorder. It's becoming dust, everything, without exception. And yet, look around us. What we see around us is staggering complexity. So here's a great puzzle. In a universe ruled by the second law of thermodynamics, how is it possible to generate the sort of complexity I've described. The answer is that it's not possible. It never happens. But listen to his response. Well, the answer seems to be the universe can create complexity, but with great difficulty. In pockets, there appear what my colleague Fred Spear calls Goldilocks conditions. Not too hot, not too cold, just right for the creation of complexity. This is a perfect analogy. He cites a fairy tale. He creates pockets where no pockets exist. Again, he's addressing the fact that evolution flies in the face of this unbending law, that everything gets worse, everything runs down, nothing improves. But evolution is supposed to be an exception. With it, things get better, they improve. That's the dilemma. So he uses the childish fairy tale, Goldilocks and the Three Bears, to suspend entropy so that he can fit in his fantasy. Listen to Cornell University address the same dilemma. Someone asked the question, I probably won't get an answer to this one, but entropy says that the universe is breaking down. Evolution says the universe is getting better. Please explain this. The astronomer points to a poker game. The universe dealt us a lucky hand. The porridge was just right. Back to the magical fairy tale and slightly more complex things appear. And where you have slightly more complex things, you can get slightly more complex things. And in this way, complexity builds stage by stage. Each stage is magical. We, as extremely complex creatures, desperately need to know this story of how the universe creates complexity despite the second law. His answer is to do what we encourage children to do with fairy tales to use their imagination. Imagine the darkest, emptiest thing you can and cube it a gazillion times, and that's where we are. And then suddenly, bam, a universe appears, an entire universe. There was nothing, then bam, the entire universe appears without a fairy godmother. It just happened. A miracle took place. Nothing created everything. Within the first second, energy itself shatters into distinct forces, including electromagnetism and gravity. And energy does something else quite magical. What are the Goldilocks conditions? Well, first, you need energy. Now, where do you find such Goldilocks conditions? Where do you find Goldilocks conditions? Nowhere. They're non-existent. There's no pocket, no lucky card, and no Goldilocks. Everything is corrupting. Nothing is getting better. Science tells us that, and it's evident everywhere we look. And our early Earth was almost perfect. But of course, life is more than just exotic chemistry. Now, information comes out of nowhere. Coherent, complex information. Actual instructions on how to create life. You'll be familiar with the double helix of DNA. Each rung contains information. So DNA contains information about how to make 
living organisms. So the information spreads. Notice that information has become part of our story. Scientists call DNA the book of life. No book of information ever created itself, ever. It's scientifically impossible without the realm of possibility. Now here's the scary part. This childish stupidity is enthusiastically applauded by people who don't seem to have the ability to think. I thank you for your attention. If you think that was foolish, we're about to look at something just as crazy. The evolution of the eye. The eye really is extraordinary, but can something so complex evolve in gradual stages? Richard, the eye is such a complex structure. I can understand why some people find it hard to believe it evolved out of nothing. Even Darwin commented on its complexity, didn't he? Yes, Darwin said that it was impossible to imagine. So, what would the first step be? So that could be the first step. Okay. But if you imagine, perhaps if you imagine proper man-made lens. Bring the bag forward a bit. There, there, perfect. That's not what you might call a real lens. Think of that as just a blob of gunge. Once you've got that, then because it works a bit better than nothing at all, you've got the raw material for natural selection to go to work. And even serious scientists have sometimes queried whether there's been enough time for the evolution of the eye. Well, suppose we start with an ancestor who didn't really have an eye at all. This animal, with hardly any eye at all, will at least be able to tell the difference between light and dark. The next stage in evolution would be to have a shallow cup. Now, let's make it bigger still now, Bryson. I've got a question for you, Professor. Why are you having Bryson help you to put together your contraption? You don't need his help. Let it make itself from nothing. The truth is you'd never wait for nothing to make itself into a design structure because you know it could never happen, not in a million years. And yet you're wanting your hearers to believe that inanimate life, rocks and mountains, all made themselves. And here you want them to believe that biological life, which is infinitely more complex, made itself from nothing. That smudge there is Bryson's hand and you can just about see a very dim image of his fingers. We can't be sure they had pinhole camera eyes, but it seems quite likely. How might the lens have evolved? Well, let's imagine that it started with just a single transparent sheet. So we have a gradual pathway all the way up Mount Improbable from no eye to an eye. So there really was no need for Darwin to shudder. Half an eye is better than no eye. Half an eye is better than 49% of an eye. 1% of an eye is better than no eye at all. Richard, the eye is such a complex structure. I can understand why some people find it hard to believe it evolved out of nothing. Even Darwin commented on its complexity, didn't he? Yes, Darwin said that it was impossible to imagine. The evolution of the eye is so quick and easy that it must have happened many, many times over. Eyes can evolve at the drop of a hat. And even Darwin commented on its complexity, didn't he? Each step is a small piece of random luck. As such, each step is not particularly impressive. In fact, it had better not be impressive, because if it was, it would be a miracle, and we'd no longer have a true explanation. The whole point of evolution is that it gets us up Mount Improbable without miracles. And energy does something else quite magical. Each stage is magical. His writing, his lectures uh, argue the case for why God is a delusion. And he's got a new one out at the moment, which is sort of a children's book uh, based on the same ideas. And it's called Outgrowing God, A Beginner's Guide. So do you think we will outgrow God? It might take centuries, but yes. So is that why you do what you do? I mean, are, are you an evangelist, if you like? Well, I suppose I'm an evangelist for truth, for scientific truth. If you look at the number of people who um, profess a religion in America and in the rest of the world, but it's notable in America, is going down. It's not entirely clear whether that, that is given over to rationalism or whether instead it's given over to, it, to um, a, a, a more vague kind of 
nonsensical sort of new ageism. I don't, I, I'm not sure about that. And I think we need to really push science, the beauty of science, not just because it's true, but because it's beautiful. Uh, and that as an, as an enemy against, as an, as an, as an armory against not just religion, but superstition generally. Professor Dawkins, you have spent your life denying the existence of God. And in doing so, you and your friends have turned many away from the gospel. You have convinced them that they are the results of a random explosion, that they are nothing but talking primates who are not made as moral creatures in the image of God. You have left them, as you have done with yourself, with no hope in their death. I do believe in evolution. Now, why is that? Well, over millions of years, it, to me it makes sense that people change like physically and biologically over time, over like very long periods of time. 18 years ago, you're just a little baby. But you have changed physically and it didn't take millions of years. So what's the difference between what you're telling me about evolution and the physical change that we have now? I mean, caterpillars turn into butterflies in a matter of weeks. Tadpoles turn into frogs in a matter of weeks. What's the difference between Darwinian evolution and what we see in natural life? So, Braden, do you believe in evolution? Yes. I'm convinced evolution is a fact. Why? Um, overwhelming scientific evidence. You think of any? Uh, namely Darwin and mostly what they teach you in schools. Do you believe in evolution? Yes. Now, when evolution first started, how did the eyes evolve? What caused them to begin evolving? Hmm. The first eye evolved. The yeah, eye is very intricate. It's got 137 million light sensitive cells. Focusing muscles move an estimated 100,000 times a day. Unspeakably complex. How did the first eye evolve? What happened? What caused it? I, don't, I actually don't have an answer to that. Now, tell me about this eye. It was just cells and then it decided it would, wanted to see. How long did this take? Over millions of years, probably. So was it an animal or was just an eye lying there, sort of a pre-eye? Well, I would think that a cell, right, came together to form more cells, and that came a little microorganism, right? Then that had incentive to live, so it developed things to help it live over millions and millions of years. Can it see yet? Uh, no. How did it eat? Um, by absorbing every, like little other things. Did it have a brain? No. How did it think? I think it just, just did whatever it did, you know? Did the brain evolve over years along with the eye that's evolving? I wouldn't think the brain evolved until it actually evolved over millions of years kind of into this animal. Well, it takes like eons at this point now. Can it see yet? Probably not. Because you need the whole eye to be fully evolved to see, don't you? Half an eye doesn't really work. Right, in the sense that maybe... Could it smell the food? Maybe it just senses it, like, uh... Where did the food come from? Food come from? When did the eye begin to see? Um, probably millions and millions of years later. No, it was just there on top of an antenna. As time went on, we needed eyes to see. Two eyes or one? Two. Two eyes? I'm guessing, huh, maybe one eye. One works fine. Why would it have one and then decide it need two? Uh, probably depth perception. I think it was more like sense, it was like a sensor organ or something. Where did that come from? Uh, from a bunch of cells thinking, uh, yeah, this sensory organ is pretty cool, might want to pass that down. Where did they come from? Want to know. That's, uh, that's a big mystery, huh? It did. We were fish? Um, I think so. I think we came from the sea. Then did we have lungs or gills under the water? Oh, no, like you would get lungs later on. Have you heard of entropy? I have not. What have you heard of the second law of thermodynamics? I have not. The universe tends itself towards chaos? Yeah. It happens everywhere. In a trillion years, all these rocks here will be turned to dust. Mm -hmm. We'll be turned to dust. The dog will be turned to dust. The flowers, the birds, the trees, even the mountains and the planets will be turned to dust. Everything is corrupting. Mm -hmm. Does that make sense? I think it definitely makes sense. You can see it everywhere. Exactly. Uh, Except with evolution. Evolution does the exact opposite. Exactly. It gets better. How do you fit evolution in with that? Because evolution says the opposite. It says things get better. They don't corrupt. Can you reconcile the two? Actually, I believe evolution is 
chaos, but sometimes they, they mess up in a way that helps them. It's like flipping a coin, basically, with your genetics. You mean luck? Yeah. And that way that helps them makes them thrive even more. So they improve? Yes. That's the opposite of entropy. How come evolution isn't subject to that? Because that creates and improves and things get better through evolution. I'm honestly not sure about that. Instead of running down, evolution improves. How could that happen? Mm, I don't know. Eventually, certain cells became alive as you may know it. Life came from non-life? could life come from non-life? It's totally impossible. You said it yourself. Like you can't just bring a rock to life. No. And you're saying there were cells lying around that developed eyes under the water and caught up on the land and evolved lungs and it took millions of years? See if you can spot an ongoing problem here. I'll address it in a few moments when it becomes more evident. Just energy. Just Where did that come from? Hmm? Sun. Where did the sun come from? Um... Uh, Probably like dust being compressed into stuff or like a bunch of hydrogen, yeah. Where did the hydrogen come from? It's the universe, basically. Where did the universe come from? Big Bang, most likely. You gotta have materials for a Big Bang, where did that come from? Um, not sure, that's all like theoretical at this point. You don't know? Nah. And when did the brain evolve? The brain evolved? Because you need a brain for eyes to work. Otherwise, you're not thinking about what you're seeing. Predators and food and things like that. It was probably very minuscule around the time eyes of, um, came into existence. Probably a little before then in order to um, control metabolic functions such as like, or to control how the organism would react to its environment. So I'd say sometime before eyes. And could man have evolved from pigs? Because if they ever give you a skin graft, they may use pig skin. Did you know that? No, I didn't know that, no. Yeah, you're very close to a pig. Pigs have got hearts and kidneys and lungs and livers. And they've got eyes and nose and mouth. I've got friends that eat like pigs, and I sound like a pig when I sleep, according to my wife, sometimes. Pigs' bodies and organs are almost identical in form and function to a human's. The heart, specifically, is roughly the same size and shape. Because of this, we already use pig valves in some heart repair. So could man have evolved from pigs? Mm -hmm. It's a thought. The problem is that evolution is as big as the human imagination. Someone who embraces it can believe anything he wants as long as he qualifies it with the word probably. Probably, I have no idea. It's probably, probably, little, probably, yeah, probably, uh, probably, after, probably, like, you probably, probably, would probably be, uh, probably, it would probably, uh, probably, it probably was by accident. Probably millions, millions of years later. You gotta say probably every few sentences because yeah. nothing is for sure. Is that right? Yeah. Probably. Mm hmm So if I continue to address the subject of Darwinian evolution, I'm going to end up going down a million rabbit trails. Let me tell you a secret. I only bring up evolution if I want to, and that's not too often. This is because we've been commanded to go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature for a reason. It's the gospel that the lost need to hear, because it's the gospel that's the power of God to salvation. You don't believe man and primates have a common ancestor? Mm, I think we, we come from, from something deeper than that, you know? I think God created us. God created us, definitely, you know? We come from the root of Adam and Eve, you know? Are you a Christian? Uh, no. Let me just share with you how you know God exists. Every building is proof of a builder. You know a builder existed because there's a building. Every painting is proof of a painter. No paintings painted themselves. Is that right? That is true. So the painting is absolute scientific proof there was a painter, and the building is absolute scientific proof there was a builder, because buildings don't build themselves, and paintings don't paint themselves. And creation is absolute proof of the creator. You can see the genius of God's creative hand, and flowers, and birds, and trees, and puppies, and kittens, and donkeys, and horses, and camels. All these things that surround us, man can't make, we can't begin to make an eye. The eye is so complex, so how could it happen from a random explosion in space and then it made itself over millions of years? You know, the Bible says God made man male and female with eyes, ears, nose, mouth, heart, liver, lungs, kidneys, all these things, and the ability to reproduce after their own kind. And so we can see 
in creation exactly what the Bible says. Well, there's different types of evolution. There's what's called speciation and adaptation. Adaptation is when birds' beaks change and there's speciation. Uh, there's varieties between dogs. There's the Chihuahua and the Great Dane. That's not Darwinian evolution. Darwinian evolution says that we have a common ancestor with primates, which I don't believe. You know why I don't believe it? Why? Because Jesus didn't believe it. Jesus said, in the beginning, God created them male and female. He didn't make them primates. He made them male and female, moral creatures with fully formed eyes. He made them with two eyes, a mouth, a nose, a brain, skin, blood, bones, heart, liver, kidneys, lungs, everything working. Didn't take millions of years, and he wasn't a primate, and he brought forth after his own kind. What do you think of that? Fascinating. It makes sense. Incredible. Yeah, it does. So he could reproduce after his own kind with a female that God created didn't have to run up on the land taking big breaths waiting for his lungs to evolve. That really is crazy talk if you think about it. Do you believe there's an afterlife? Um, I hope so. That's what I'm hoping. Yeah? Why? It's kind of scary. Like, just black nothingness. You afraid of death? No, I'm okay with it now, but... Do you no one's okay with that. It's horrific. It's like jumping out of a plane at night without a parachute. Are you afraid of death? Mmm... Kind of. You know what death is called? Uh, death? Uh... The Grim Reaper. And there is something you can do about it. Have you ever looked into what you can do about death? Uh, no, not really. Do you think God could be the answer to death? I think God puts death as a kind of a inspiration for you to do something with your life. Now watch the dynamic change as we do what Jesus did and address the conscience using the moral law that is the Ten Commandments. Do you think God is happy with you or angry at you? I think he's pretty indifferent. I haven't done really anything. You haven't done anything? I haven't done anything bad. What's going to happen to you when you die? Um, you go to hell. Do you have to repent and trust in Christ? And you're not doing that? No. Let's get that fixed up. Do you think you're a good person? If we go based on what the scriptures say, no. We'll go what the scriptures say. Have you lied and stolen? Oh yeah. Most You're a lying thief? Yeah. What's the difference between man and animals? Do you know? The difference is that we believe in justice. That's one of the big differences. We set up court systems. We try murderers and rapists for doing wrong. Animals don't do that. They have no sense of righteousness. And that's because you and I are created in God's image with a sense of right and wrong and a conscience, a God-given, society-shaped conscience. I'm going to ask you a question and change the dynamics slightly, if that's okay. Do you think God is happy with you or angry at you? I believe he's happy with me. So you're not doing anything that could displease God? How many lies have you told in your life? How many lies? Like 10. Are you lying and stealing? Not really right now. Have you used God's name in vain? Oh yes. God's name is holy. Why would you Why would you use it as a cuss word? I know, I feel bad right now, now that you're mentioning it, you know. You should, it's evil to use God's name as a cuss word. You wouldn't do that with your mother's name. Have you been looking at pornography? Pornography? Um You know when someone repeats a question. They're abiding time to try and think of a lie. Have you been looking at pornography? Last week, maybe, yeah. Jesus said if you look at a woman and lust for her, you commit adultery with her in your heart. Have you ever looked at a woman with lust? No. Are you homosexual? No. Have you looked at pornography? Have you ever looked at a woman with lust? No, sir. Have you had sex before marriage? Yeah. Oh, yes. Had sex before marriage? Yes, I have. So, Katie, I'm not judging you, and I appreciate your honesty, uh -huh. but you've just told me you're a lying thief uh -huh. and a fornicator. It's hard to go around not wanting that stuff, you know, when you're out here. and We need more people like you, you know? Well, let's just get back to you. You know, the Bible says, hang on, the Bible says we drink iniquity like water. We love the darkness. We hate the light. That's the problem. You love sin. And the wages of sin is death. You don't want it to take you to hell. Where's your conscience? Blaspheming in the name of the God that gave you life, fornicating when you know it's wrong, looking at pornography. Your conscience should be doing its duty. It's God given. It's like a smoke detector. And you've taken the batteries out of the smoke detector. It's meant to alarm you. So this is deadly serious. If you were to die today, God would justly damn you, and we don't want that to happen. You know what's going to cause you to depart from the sin you love? 
It's the fear of the Lord. If you fear God, if you value your soul, you'll repent and trust Christ. Every idle word you've spoken and everything you've done in darkness has been seen by God. And the Bible says, His wrath abides on you. And I'll hate you to end up in hell. Now tell me, why did Jesus die on the cross? Um, for the forgiveness of our sins. He uh, sacrificed himself for our sins. Yeah, we broke the law, the Ten Commandments. Jesus paid the fine. Do you know what God did for guilty sinners so we wouldn't have to go to hell? Um, if I remember right, the cross. Yeah, Jesus suffered and died. You and I broke God's law. Jesus paid the fine. It's as simple as that. If God judges you by the Ten Commandments on Judgment Day, we've looked at four, are you going to be innocent or guilty? Uh, based on that, then probably guilty. Heaven or hell? Probably hell, based on that. Does that concern you? It does concern me. It horrifies me. Do you know what death is, according to the Bible? According to the Bible? Not according to the Bible. It's wages. The Bible says the wages of sin is death, Romans 6.23. And it's wages in the same way a criminal will be given wages by a judge. If a criminal has murdered three young girls after he raped them, the judge says, you've earned the death sentence. This is what's due to you. This is your wages. And we think sin is trivial. We say, oh, I just told little white lies. Mm -hmm. But God says sin is so serious in his eyes because he's holy and perfect that it demands the death sentence. That's mm -hmm. how serious it is. Right. Now, do you know what God did for guilty sinners so we wouldn't have to go to hell? Do you know what you need? Uh, no. What, what do I need to... You need God's mercy. Right. If you're in court and all the evidence is in and you're guilty, you fling yourself on the mercy of the court. Mm -hmm. And the Bible says God is rich in mercy to all that call upon him. He provided a way for you to be forgiven and clean in his sight. Jesus suffered and died on the cross to take the punishment for the sin of the world. He said this, No man takes my life from me. I have power to lay it down and I have power to raise it up. Mm -hmm. The Bible says God commended his love toward us and that while we're still sinners, Christ died for us. Katie, are you afraid of death? I don't know, honestly. Everybody is. Yeah. Katie, we talked about the second law of thermodynamics the bible actually calls it another law it calls it the law of sin and death it's in the book of romans and it says the whole of creation is subject to corruption it's groaning and travail but the bible says the law of sin and death was overcome by the law of life in christ jesus if you repent and put your trust in jesus god says he'll remit every sin you've ever committed and he'll grant you everlasting life as a free gift upon your repentance and faith in jesus do you know what repentance is uh, it's something we always hear yeah, It's more than confession It's when you turn from sin And you say I'm going to be a Christian And I'm not going to lie and steal and lust and fornicate Because if I do I'm playing the hypocrite And I don't want to deceive myself mm -hmm. So repentance must be sincere And to be genuine mm -hmm. And then trust in Jesus like you trust a parachute You know the night I was confronted with the words of Jesus Whoever looks at a woman to lust for her Has committed adultery already with her in his heart My heart sunk not because I felt sorry for my sins, but because he was putting his finger on what was giving me great pleasure in life. And I was saying, no, I love it, I love it. But when I saw the cross, the cost of my redemption, that Christ had to die so I could be forgiven, that broke my heart. You know, if I stepped between you and a bullet and gave my life for you, it should break your heart. And you should say, man, that's a wonderful thing you did. And when you looked at the cross, you just say, Christ died for me while I was still a sinner? He's prepared to forgive me and change me and grant me everlasting life as a free gift, guilty though I am. That resurrection was God destroying the power of the grave for you. Death has lost its sting, but you must repent of all sin and trust in Christ. And the miracle of conversion is that God will give you a new heart with new desires, so you love that which is pure and good and right and just. That's a miracle. Born again, new heart, new desires. And when you have temptations to sin, you'll know that God's made a way of escape, so you may be able to bear it. That's what the Bible says. So you're going to think about what we talked about? Definitely. Most definitely. When are you going to ask God to forgive you and create a clean heart in you? When's that going to happen? Um, probably find the church this week and... Uh... No. You might die between now and then. Get right with God today, now. Walk away from here and say, God, forgive me. I've been a wicked person. I need your forgiveness. And he'll change your heart, give you new desires, so you love that which is right and good and just. Make sense? Yes, sir. I'll leave you with the words of Jesus. What shall it profit a man if he gains the whole world and loses his own soul? Think of that, okay? I will think of that. It's so simple a child can understand it. Does that make sense? Yeah. You're going to think about this? Yeah. 
seriously think about it? Yes, sir. Do you have a Bible at home? Yes, I do. My grandma has one, like two of them. Is she a Christian? Yes, she is. No doubt she's praying for you, though. She always is. She always is. Well, I'm outside. Well, you're listening today because of her prayers and God's faithfulness. And you know, Nicholas, evolution is a non-issue. It doesn't matter. Just put it aside. Think about your eternity. What happens if death comes upon you and where you're going to spend eternity? And if you want to be a Christian and believe in evolution, it won't last very long. You'll realize it's baseless. It's unscientific and that God created man in his own image and he wants him to live forever. That's the gospel. So don't let that hold you back. Don't let it be a stumbling block. That makes sense? Mm -hmm. You're going to think about what we talked about? Yeah, I'm going to think about it more now. You're going to die. Everything dies. Everything winds down. So entropy, the scientific principle of the second law of thermodynamics, flies in the face of evolution. Things don't get better. They don't improve. They don't evolve. They get worse. And you'll see it happen in the mirror as you get older. God says your crimes against his law are so serious he's given you the death sentence. You're on death row waiting to die. We've got a nice blue roof normally, not today, it's raining. We have good air conditioning, wind, and good lighting, the sun, but this life is a holding cell. So does it concern you that if you died today and death seized upon you, the grim reaper took you today, that you'd end up in hell? Uh, yeah, if I believed in, I really, really believed in that, yeah, I would be concerned, but I don't I really see that humans are very, what do you call it, this inherently bad, but we can't get good, so... So you're agreeing with the Bible, it says humans are inherently bad, we've inherited a sinful nature. Sal, you may not be concerned you're going to hell, but it horrifies me, I love you, I care about you, I'm telling you the truth because I care about you. You don't make friends by saying things like this, but I'm deeply concerned. Look, you're going to die, we agree on that, you've sinned. We know that to be true. You know sin is wrong because you've got a conscience. After death, the judgment. And if God brings out those secret sins, those sexual imaginations, all the things you've done in darkness, God says he's going to bring out into pure light on judgment day. That's a fearful thing. Better to fall in the face of the sun than to fall in the hands of the living God. So you may not be fearful, but I'm fearful for you. You're like a kid holding a stick of dynamite. You know, entropy, or the second law of thermodynamics, is all around us, and the Bible actually speaks of it in Romans chapter 8, written 2,000 years ago. It speaks of the law of sin and death. The soul that sins shall die. It says the whole of, whole of creation is subject to corruption. That means it's, it's crumbling. It's dying, the whole of creation. Everything. But it says this. The law of life in Christ Jesus has made me free from the law of sin and death. God says, I'll give you my Holy Spirit, which is life itself, and the life in you will conquer death. Because where there's life, death can't stay. And that's what happens when you're born again, when you trust in Christ. God gives you his Holy Spirit, which is eternal, and puts his invisible life in you and seals you. You become his for eternity, and death loses its sting. Sal, you've been such a good sport listening to me, and I know you didn't agree with quite a lot of it, but you've been very gracious. Um, do you still believe in evolution? Uh, yeah. Well, that doesn't matter. Just put it aside. If you're going to eat fish, you don't eat the bones, you put them aside. So get right with God. Listen to the voice of your conscience. Think about Christ dying on the cross. God's made provision for you to live forever and be free from the power of death and the fear of death through simple repentance and faith in the Savior. You've been real patient with me. What do you think about what we talked about? Um, if any of it's true, I'll deal with it when I die. No, you don't want to do that because that means you'll end up in hell. It's too late. Your fate will be sealed. So deal with it before you die. You know, have this good sense to put on a parachute before you jump, not think about it after you jump. Probably talk to my uh, religious friend about it. You got a friend who's a Christian? Yeah. Well, you're listening today because of his prayers. Did you know that? He'll be praying for your salvation. And when we look back on how we became Christians, we see God's hand come upon us and prepare our hearts and soften us and open us. In fact, the Bible says you cannot come to Christ unless God draws you to himself. And I'm trusting that today God's drawing you to himself and that we're going to see you in heaven and not hear of you being damned in hell. That would horrify me. So you're going to think about this? Yes. Have a Bible at home? Yes. Just after the camera was turned off, Sal confided in me that he had suicidal thoughts. So I gave him the little booklet um, you're not alone. And on the way back, uh, we got caught in a rainstorm, didn't we, Sam? We got soaked, but it was sure worth it. Does this make sense? Yes.
going to think about this? Yes. You're going to think seriously about it? Yes. When are you going to get right with God? When are you going to repent and trust in Christ? Now. Now? May I pray with you? Yes. Father, I pray for India that this day she will truly repent because of your kindness. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Well, there are two things you must do to be saved. You must repent and trust in Jesus. When are you going to do that? Whenever, the, the sooner I can. Right, so possibly right now. Right now? Yeah. You know what you're doing? You're giving up all sin. You're going to say, I'm going to turn from sin perpetually and I'm going to trust Christ as my Savior. Is that what you want to do? Yes, sir. May I pray with you? Father, I pray for Roger. I thank you for his open heart and his honesty before you and acknowledging his sins. Does this make sense? It does make sense. So you're going to think about this? I will think about this. You're going to think seriously about it? Yes, I will. At the moment, Katie, you're like a man on the edge of a plane 10,000 feet up. He knows he has to jump, and this is his plan. He's going to flap his arms to try and save himself. Mm -hmm. I say to that man, don't do that. Trust the parachute. So don't try and save yourself on Judgment Day by relying on your goodness. Mm -hmm. Transfer your trust from yourself to the Savior. The second you do that, you've got God's promise, and he cannot lie because he's without sin, that he'll forgive your sins and grant you everlasting life as a free gift. Does this make sense? I think it definitely makes sense. <sighs> Katie, did you hear me sigh? Because this is so important. Yes. This is your life. Um, Katie, if you were to die today, you'd end up in hell. There are two things you must do to be saved. You must repent and trust alone in Jesus. Mm -hmm. When are you going to do that? As soon as I can. You like today? If I can today, then yes. You can? I can. Yeah, the Bible says, whoever calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. And then, it's, and then it says, today if you hear his voice, don't harden your hearts. Today is the day of salvation. So can I pray for you? Oh, uh, sure, of course. Be embarrassed? I wouldn't be embarrassed, no. Father, I pray for Katie. Thank you for her open heart today. That she'll understand the issues we've spoken about today and listen to the voice of her conscience and understand that you see her sins and know you've made provision for them. And this day, repent and put her faith entirely in Jesus and pass from death to life. In his name we pray. Amen. I'm going to give you some literature. Do you ever get suicidal thoughts? I do, actually. Okay. Um, <laughs> I'm going to give you a little booklet that will help you. You get depressed? I do, yes. Yeah, life is very depressing, so you're not, you don't have a mental disease. You're normal, you're sane to be depressed with life and the fact we're all going to die. And I'm going to give you a little booklet called You're Not Alone, uh, Principles to Help You Lift Yourself Out of Depression and Fight Those Horrible Suicidal Thoughts, okay? Okay. <laughs> now here's something that will help you grow in your faith. Read the Word daily using this amazing one-year devotional, Jesus in Red. For more than 48 years, I've read the Bible every day without fail. I thought every Christian did that, but sadly, many don't. So get into a habit you'll never regret by reading the Word daily using this beautiful little devotional. 365 readings based solely on the words of Jesus. There's nothing like it. Get it through Amazon, livingwaters.com, or at your bookstore.